Thank you, Kathy. So what you see on the slide is a prototypic tissue. And uh, it's made up of cells, which uh, I think the majority of people in the audience work on. But it's a truism that every cell in the body, other than circulating cells, have matrix around them and are intimately associated with it. And that includes some of your, I'm sorry? Yes, it's the, it's, the, it's the prototypic tissue comprising bricks and mortar, which is cells and extracellular matrix. I'm sorry, I thought the metaphor was... Uh, <laughs> so, um, and that includes your, your favorite organ for many in the audience, the brain, where perineuronal nets have been known of for a long time, and Roger Sen suggested, for example, they may be the seats of long-term memory and, uh, and learning. So the matrix, unlike the mortar shown in this image, is extremely dynamic. In the light of this year's uh, Nobel Prize, it, it also has a chronobiology to it, surprisingly. And so it undergoes tremendous gymnastics in the course of our day-to-day -day living. And you can imagine that as you move your body parts, you exercise, you age, there is a dynamic uh, change in, in every part of the body, a, a hypertrophy or an atrophy, and that involves remodeling of the matrix as well. So. Um, <clears throat> What you see on, on this slide are two cells, uh, one here and one here, and between them is this uh, inanim so-called inanimate uh, material called the matrix. Uh, all cells uh, in culture, for example, actually have a pericellular matrix around them that's primarily carbohydrate-rich and sometimes called the glycocalyx, but you won't see it until you look for it. So in that respect, I would venture the very provocative statement that Almost every signal that the cell sees either arises within the matrix or has the potential to be modified by it. And so this matrix is very instructive. It tells cells which way is up and down. It provides adhesive inputs. It can provide anti-adhesive inputs. It can sequester growth factors. And for that reason, the fate of the matrix is intrinsically tied to the fate of the cell. And so matrix has very important roles in development and in disease. And in most disease states, you have an aberrant matrix. Either you have too much, too little, it's in the wrong place, or it has the wrong stoichiometries. So the structures you see here include collagen fibrils, which are very complex structures that are arranged differently in different tissues. And so one of the questions, the big questions outstanding in the field is, how does this matrix assemble? How is it remodeled? And what are the regulatory mechanisms that ensure that the cell always sees the appropriate matrix environment? These questions have not been addressed in a big way uh, over the years. There are many dedicated matrix biologists working on very specialized uh, areas of matrix, and so I really commend the Allen Frontiers Group and the AHA for identifying this as a priority topic. So um, <clears throat> the project that I've only just started to work on is a relatively simple one. It addresses the turnover of extracellular matrix components in cardiovascular tissues. Um, the, the concept behind it is very simple. A protease um, works by modifying a target, which is called a substrate. The biology of a protease is really the biology of its substrate. So once you find those substrates, you come back to the biology because the effects that you can see include a loss of function effect from losing a functional moiety or gain of function effect by generating proteoforms that have novel independent functions. And there's abundant literature to suggest that in addition to alternative splicing, which amplifies the effect of a gene, proteolysis, which is a, 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 a very common modification, can create new proteoforms in tissues uh, that might actually comprise the functional uh, entity resulting from a transcriptional event. So proteolysis is irreversible, so it has, definitely has consequences. You can't put the molecules back together again. It, as I mentioned to you, it modifies protein and ECM function. And it is widespread, and we don't really understand it in total. So one of the projects uh, that we will uh, undertake as part of this initiative is, a, um, is, is what I have termed, I've taken the liberty of terming forward degradomics. Degradomics is a term introduced by Chris Overall a, a few years ago to refer to all of the cleaved uh, molecules in a given biological situation. In a forward degradomics approach, we would basically take a tissue, uh, de novo, and determine all the novel proteoforms using new technologies for labeling um, uh, unmodified, unblocked N-termini, 
and uh, recent advances in mass spectrometry that allow us to sensitively go through thousands and thousands of, uh, of proteoforms and identify them confidently. And the goal is to identify the, the proteoforms in two situations, in aortic aneurysms, which are a, uh, a significant and dangerous health challenge, and in the development of the heart, which goes through extraordinary amounts of gymnastics before the four-chambered functional heart is formed. So as one example, um, I have here for you two images. The one on the right shows a normal aorta. It consists of 60 layers of these elastic lamellae that you see here in black. Uh, the mouse, in contrast, only has seven. And that reflects the different uh, biomechanical forces acting on the human or the mouse heart. But it's important to know that this structure is formed roughly around birth and cannot be regenerated. And so this structure, the matrix within it, gives it, endows it with the ability to withstand billions of cycles of cardiac impulse over, over our lifetimes. In aortic aneurysms, you get a breakdown in this structure. And the hallmark of aneurysms that occur in the ascending part of the aorta, which is the big tube coming out of the heart, and the abdominal aorta, which are the two common areas for aneurysms, are very different. In the uh, aortic aneurysms affecting the thoracic aorta, for example, you can see that you've lost elastic fibers. You've gained a lot of this blue material. And you've got a, a total disruption of the cellular morphology with loss of cells in many places and rounding up of cells, whereas they're normally uh, uh, strap-shaped. This is a, a histopathological hallmark of this disease that's called medial degeneration. And so one of the things we did recently was to isolate the blue material, which is stained proteoglycan, which is clearly dominating the landscape in specific regions of the aorta uh, in this disease, and determined what an effect was the total proteoglycanome of the wall of this lesion and the wall using mass spectrometry. And one of the surprising findings we made was that much of this was a proteoglycan called agrican, which is a major component of the cartilage and brain extracellular matrix, has a tremendous swelling potential, and therefore is extremely dangerous to have within the wall of the, of the aorta. So we will be fully annotating the ECM substrate landscape of the aorta by identifying proteoforms that result from um, ambient proteases to try and understand what exactly is the makeup of this matrix and how much remodeling does it undergo in the course of a normal aorta uh, physiology and in the ca case of this disease and abdominal aortic aneurysms. The second concept is, uh, is again, a, a modified one from genetics. It's called reverse degradomics. Here, we would take a candidate protease. In our case, that happens to be a family of secreted metalloproteases called the ADAM-TS proteases. We would knock it out in mice, and we have several such knockouts now that have profound cardiovascular defects. We would determine the phenotype, and then based on the phenotype and the cell type that is affected by it, we would identify the substrates. So this is a more targeted approach. It's protease selective, but it is still unbiased because it helps us understand <clears throat> the landscape in a way that no other method can. And to, to understand the significance of this, I think you have to realize that what we've been doing for decades now is to take a candidate protease of interest, take a matrix molecule of interest in vitro, and try and put them together to see what's cleaved. So this is a way of looking at the big picture if we can possibly manage it. And here's one application of this. This is a, a mouse mutant, uh, which is deficient in two proteases. These two genes, uh, ADAMTS1 and ADAMTS5, are very tightly linked, so we weren't able to make double knockouts. The single knockouts of these proteases, which are closely related, have fairly normal hearts. So we've adopted a, uh, a hybrid approach in which we've genetically inactivated uh, ADAMTS1 and we've used antibodies to ADAMTS5 to inactivate it pharmacologically. And the heart that you see here on the right has a, as a, as a phenotype that's quite similar to a severe human condition called tetralogy of fallow, with an overriding aorta, seen here, a ventricular septal defect, and not seen is a pulmonic valve stenosis. So we do know of one substrate in the matrix that is cleaved by these enzymes, but with such a complex defect, we anticipate there to be considerable turmoil in the normal turnover of matrix proteins. So these, this mutant and others like it will help us understand how cardiac uh, tissues are remodeled during morphogenesis. And to give you another example, two other proteases we work on, ADAMTS9 and ADAMTS20, 
are required for the formation of the primary cilium. And one of the things we'd like to know, for example, is to ask, is it the primary defect in the matrix around the cells that affects the cilium, which is very closely opposed to the matrix? Or, is, or, or do these proteins have a role that we haven't foreseen yet, which is acting from within? And so it would blur, in a way, the distinction between cell biology on the one hand and matrix biology on the other. So we have very capable uh, team members in this effort. Our proteomics work is done with Belinda Willard, who is the director of our proteomics work, as well as my colleague Ulrich Aufdem Keller in Copenhagen. And we work very closely with cardiothoracic surgeons at the Cleveland Clinic who are willing to spare time from their busy schedules to help us understand uh, aortic aneurysms. So the anticipated outcomes are straightforward. New fundamental knowledge, always important, and we heard from Bart today how uh, undertaking treatment without understanding the fundamentals is, is prone to hazards. We'll understand pathways relevant to development as well as to regeneration, and hopefully we'll also identify new biomarkers for disease. Thank you.